Good to see you now, Betsy. I come and go. We're all set. Okay. Some people will do anything on camera, but like if I'm taking a sip of something or whatever, I prefer to mute. You don't <laughs> want to reveal what it is, right? <laughs> yeah, I take my camera. Like, there goes Liam. He doesn't mind. So I just like you know, certain things, yeah. Okay, so it's uh, four o'clock. Today is February 10th. This is a town council finance committee workshop um, to primarily discuss budget goals and uh, targets for next year to try to lay out expectations for um, what will make us happy, I guess is uh, a way to phrase it. Um, this is, uh, so I guess we all play different roles in the, in the budget process, right? From, uh, from town staff to the school to the town council and uh, they're balancing. So there's no absolute uh, perfect way to do this. But I thought a good place for us to start today was uh, just to, I don't know if you can show this on the screen, Liam, to, to show the, uh, the two goals that relate to the finance committee that uh, are the reason we're meeting today for the, work, for the workshop. And <clears throat> they're the second and third goals on, on this list. But uh, the first one was we, we took on the responsibility of, of getting better at communicating our town finances and the well-being of our town to the, uh, both to the council and to the general public. And I think that's a common thing that we're going to carry as we talk about anything this year. So I, I, I wanted to make sure we at least touched on that. And the second one, and more specifically to today, is to establish, establish a specific first reading budget goals for school and town in collaboration with the Board of Education. Um, and that's underneath, we've already agreed as a council that we're going to try to target a 3% increase in the mill rate or less. Hey, Ruth. Hi. Ruth. <laughs> coming. And John, you know, when I was rereading these, the, un the, the call out under the fourth bullet also belongs to us, really. So a lot of the goals revolve around our committee. We placed a lot of trust in us. Yes, right. So, um, so I mean, but I, I don't think they're unreasonable. I think it's something that we can accomplish. And um, the first one is, is probably one of the more complex ones. And I, I know, John, this is your first time through the cycle. Um, I went through it once, uh, but it was during a time when uh, you know my personal life was a little hectic, um, so I, I couldn't get into it quite as deeply as I, I maybe should have or, or could have. Um, so I thought it might help to start at the beginning, which is um, the the actual budget order, which we this is what we actually approve as a council. Underneath that, we we approve the detailed budget, but really as a council, we uh, have the authority to establish uh, departments and um, to allocate funds at a high level. Um, we also have the ability uh, on the town side to um, you know, redline a, a specific budget if we so see fit. Uh, but the town manager also has the ability to shift things. So it, there's kind of that dynamic that goes on. But uh, if you can scroll down to the, the, the fiscal order, Liam, I wanted to start with that. And, and Betsy, this is similar to what you provided. But today, this is the level of detail that the council manages uh, the town to. Uh, and it, there's a couple of distinct sides to the equation. This top section here is how much we're going to spend. And in particular, we break it out by department for the municipal side. And on the school side, we just say this is how much we're going to spend on, on schools and on nutrition. I'm not exactly clear on why we segment those two things, but that's how we do it today. The other side of the equation is how much are we going to collect from um, the taxpayer, right? So there's the how much are we going to spend and how much are we going to collect from the taxpayer. And the difference is not something that we really control. It's something that the town manager has to try to manage it to, right? So we spend more money than we collect from the taxpayer because we have other revenue streams. Um, we have uh, money that comes in from excise taxes, from fees that we charge for services. There's a uh, it, it, you know, a lot of intercompany things that happen as, as the organization. So, but we, what we put in the budget order for those revenue streams is an estimate. And Tom has some policies that he can adhere to as he's, um, you know, going through the normal co course of his job that if it looks like we're straying too far out of range, he can curtail spending um, to try to bring things back in line so that we um, keep our financial policies intact. Uh, so I guess the, the, it's somewhat of a political decision 
uh, we've already decided as a council that we're comfortable with the 3% or less increase in the mill rate. So the, how much are we gonna pass on to the taxpayers is pretty well established. It could change a little bit, but, um, and it's, it's a little unlikely. In order to approve that, I guess the, the, the way to frame the other question is how much spending are we comfortable with? And um, this is what we did last year. There's a couple of things that we approved on this budget order that I, I was concerned or, or had an issue with. Right now, the town manager can't shift things between departments without um, council approval. There's a caveat to that because we created a couple of new departments. Uh, one was called uh, proposed municipal reductions to be distributed later. And another was proposed finance committee municipal reductions. We actually approved them looking like that. And because of that, he has complete flexibility to move money. How you know, Obviously he still works for us, but um, it's, a, it's a control issue where I, I would prefer us if we're going to make adjustments that we actually stipulate where it goes or make sure that that is finalized when we do approve the budget order. I think it might make your life easier as well, Ruth. Yes, if I could um, add in, that is how we normally do it, that 230 and the 793 um, is usually already allocated within the various departments. But uh, truthfully, I just finalized that uh, like last week, so. <laughs> well, I, I tried to get a detailed budget and you, you, because of this, you, you can't. I, uh, right, so, so next year, those two luck columns will be gone, our two rows, excuse me, will be gone and, and whatever the adjustments are will be mixed in with the uh, various departments. In a lot John, of it, John probably, what, was, what was the rationale for why we had those two items last year? I, I think there were so many moving pieces that um, there was probably a reluctance on the, the, the part of the finance committee to specifically earmark those. Um, and, and probably a lack of understanding about, the, you know, this is one of our primary tools as a council for directing the activity of the town. And uh, I, I, it was a strange year. I, I, I think... I, it, the detail is it's in a series of presentations and I know like I started getting frustrated not because anybody was doing anything wrong but just like okay which presentation am I going to pull to see where that 730 is and then you know so it, it was all COVID related just to answer your question John and then you know at one point I did ask if we could put it back in the line item and maybe um, uh, JC you did too but it just was too much with everything going on um, with the with the COVID year to pull it, you know, and the school department was doing the same thing. They had another column um, that than we had at, where they were kind of taken in and putting out, taken in and putting out on the line item detail. But um, the detail is there on that. I mean, so Ruth could attest to that. It, it wasn't just this bucket, you know. It's a it's exact numbers of what went where. Tom explained it all. You know, if you want to listen to twelve hours worth of budget presentations, you would actually see where it all went. But um, you know, it's a, it was a weird year and I can't see, I doubt it would, would ever happen again, but I shouldn't mm -hmm. say that. That makes sense. Never say never, but really good catch by, uh, JC, you know, it does really, it, it does, uh, really impact what exactly what you're saying. So that's, that's very interesting. It seemed very practical at the time when we were doing it. I'll just say that. Yeah. Um, the other piece, if I could, regarding the school's budget where we listed as just one number, that's the, that's, I believe, under the charter, that's all the council has access to. I mean, you can cut them a million dollars or $50 million or 10 bucks, whatever, but that you can only adjust the bottom line and the rest of it is up to the school board to allocate. So I think that's why it's just one number. I actually questioned whether we had authority to segment the school nutrition and adult ed versus the school. So we actually break it into two numbers now and, um, the Charter Commission is actually looking into that as well because oh, okay. there's some conflicts in it in the Charter. So anyway, they're getting legal opinions and um, they're looking into that as well. And, and I believe there is state law like a, like the school, we say we give them a bottom line, but the state requires that they cannot, they can't change their allocation by what's Ruth. It's a really small percentage, right? That they, that they're only allowed to change their their uh, buckets, you know, how they allocated money. So they're governed by state law on that. And then adult ed also by 
the state has to be shown separately. It does. Okay. Okay. So I, I think we covered how much we're going to ask from the, the taxpayer and then how much are we going to collect uh, or how much are we going to spend? Um, right now, if you look at the school um, order, it, we had an educating operating budget, including debt of 52,777,000. Uh, and then we also call out a, uh, a, how much we're going to raise uh, from local property taxes as the local share. I don't know, Ruth, does that net number, what's the significance of that? I guess we're, we're authorizing them to spend 52 million. We're gonna collect the 70 million that's a, a little bit lower either way from the taxpayer. Does that 47 million have any impact? It just says how much of the property taxes, the estimated property taxes are going towards education. So it's informational. It's just informational. Okay. Um, something else that was unique to last year was we actually called out 533,000 for pandemic related expenses and we <clears throat> added that to the school authorized budget. Um, we did segment it so that, uh, you know, as we're trying to, to come up with targets for, for next year, um, we can account for that or factor that in. Um, and then we also call out capital projects. So. This is something that's taken me probably the, my entire time on council to start to get my arms around is we authorize spending on um, non-voter approved capital projects through the budget process. We don't fund them right away. We'll, we'll fund them over time through a, a mix of debt and other sources, uh, right? It could, it could be through taxes as well. But where the, it gets a little complicated is when we actually go and do the, the um, the bond order, we're gonna pull back projects that have been in process for a couple of years and we'll actually be issuing debt for those projects. Um, not, and there might be a couple that are in this year's um, budget packet as well, but really we're, we're authorizing budget authority for future years when we authorize the capital budget. Well, we did have that debate, John, whether or not we had the authority, the sitting council had the authority to not authorize what past councils had done. Of course, you've already got midway spending, you wouldn't do that. But a project that had already been um, approved by past council, but that we had not started for whatever reason. Um, and so we, I don't think we came to any resolution on that. I think a, a sitting council probably does have that authority, but we do actually vote on it when um, Ruth puts our bond package together for us. So it's, it's, it's kind right. of interesting. I don't know that a council can remove budget authority. Maybe we can. It's not something that I've come across. Uh, so what we did is we created a budget for these things, but we didn't necessarily create funding for them. And that's where, you know, it comes back into the whole revenue side of the equation that, that's really more managed by the town manager. Um, but you're right. When the bond order comes up, we could say no at that time. Um, I think that would be a, an option. And then if I might, I know that our bond council, uh, the legal firm, uh, Bernstein Schur, Sawyer Nelson, Shauna, um, and her predecessors have always asked that when we appropriate funds that we at that same time authorize the funding, whatever that funding is. And I know that's the piece that we haven't always done is we kind of do it after the fact later on. I didn't pick up on that wrinkle. So Maybe we do. When we, if we look at the capital improvement. Well, we do it during the budget process, but if something comes up in the middle, like all of a sudden we need a new truck because it broke or an accident or something, we'll appropriate, you know, you say, yes, spend the money. But then there's no, usually we have a hard time remembering to actually determine how we're going to fund it. Yeah, because that could change, right? That we're, we're trying to balance what's going into this year's budget um, from an expense how much we're collected from the taxpayer and then other revenue sources perspective. But really these things happen out over a longer period of time. Right. Um, so it's not an exact science, I guess. Are we bound by what we put in the budget order for? Uh, no, as a matter of fact, I think it was the capital. If you were to look at like the prior years, I don't think we had a, um, how much was coming from the local source. So, you know, it was like, we have it everywhere else, but we didn't have it here. How come we don't have it here? So we kind of added it in. And 
So we can make adjustments to pieces of it. Um, I guess the way I think about uh, when we make the decision for how to determine how much uh, bonding we want to do, it might make sense to do it relative to projects that already have, are eligible for funding that have already been approved. So we match what's going to hit this year, you know, this coming year's budget or appropriation with the Q. From a, but that's the revenue side of the equation. So I don't know actually. And the, uh, the other piece with the bond orders, which is kind of why we do it after the fact is we might have a pick a number $500,000 project. If we create the bond order at that point in time, that means we can borrow up to $500,000. However, we might only spend $400,000. And so we don't want to really bond that extra 100,000 if we don't need right, it. Right, right. We just exactly. do it just, just in time. And then we do end up putting a fair amount back, I would say for lack of a better term, not, you know, it didn't ever come out of the budget. So yeah, that, especially when we get good rates. Um, so yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> it's not super straightforward, but it all works. In terms I've of- I've got one more um, recent learning that I'll, I'll throw out there is we, we have a number of shared services between uh, the municipal side of the budget and the school side of the budget. budget. And even within the municipal side, I think um, Public Works does, uh, uh, provides gas and other services, uh, vehicle maintenance and whatnot for police and fire. And uh, uh, MIS is a sh uh, management information is a, a shared service. So the staffing sits on the uh, municipal side, but services are, are charged to and, and provided to the school side. Well. So you're essentially seeing the same dollars in both budgets to some extent. So if we have say $700,000 of um, MIS school costs, you're gonna see that 700,000 in the school budget and you're also gonna see it in the municipal budget. And they're, they're both right. There's gonna be a, a revenue transaction that nets them out at the end of the day. Uh, but as I was looking at our gross budget, how that's trended over time, it's inflated a little bit for things like that. Um, because uh, you know our gross budget of 101 million, uh, we don't actually need 101 million to to run the town. It's, it's somewhat less than that because of these um, arrangements that we have. Do you do anything with the gross budget number, the total number, Ruth? No, not really, because uh -huh. I know that the the revenues or the intergovernmental intergovernmental revenues are going to offset. And that's broken out in the budget book. I mean, there is a row, a line item row section. I think it comes at the end of the big spreadsheet, right, Ruth? Like it'll say this much is coming from this source, this much is coming from that source. It is it is broken out in the budget. You can see it, at least on our side. I can't speak for the school, but um, I know you, you get to see what we think we're going to get reimbursed. Um, in the I, I asked what some of them were, you know, some of them were the, some of the programs that Chief so what, what it does do in the department level is like, it definitely like, especially at, at, oh, maybe like in the police budget, police budget is not as high as that bottom line looks in the budget book because they do get this intergovernmental money back to pay for some of their programs and even I believe a position type thing. So um, yeah, so it's in there, but it's not to your point, John, it's not allocated back to that department that's gonna actually receive it. So the public works budget might look larger than, you know, because and there may not be a way to specifically allocate it back, but. And, and on the police, those revenues are actual revenues. They're coming from federal government. So um, in that case, those are true revenues. They're right. Awesome. Okay. Okay. So now that I've confused everybody to death, but I think it's, I, I, this is one of the more important things I think that we do as a council is approve the budget order. So I, I, I think it's worth spending some time with to try to understand it. Um, and I, I'm not sure if I was clear, but the, the how much we're going to ask, there's two questions really, how much we're going to spend and how much we're going to ask of the taxpayer, taxpayers that the council controls. Um, the, the council is pretty firm on the 3% the or less mill rate increase. And I, I think we can agree with that. So the goal today is how much spending are we going to be comfortable with or do we think the council will become comfortable with to approve a budget that has that level of spending and that 3% or less ask from the taxpayer? Or or maybe kind of the way Sarah described it on the school side, 
what do we as a committee think are the priorities for that spending? Because I think Tom will get to the bottom line, you know, um, because he always does. Um, but, you know, for example, I think we already outlined one to try to catch up some capital expenditures, I think we said was a high priority. So I'm wondering if we have any others um, and, uh, or if, if Liam knows of any, Liam and Ruth, you know, based on talking with Tom of things that are gonna be, you know, critically important um, this year, I think it might be worth talking about the contracts that are coming out, not in detail, but just to let folks know about that. And, um, you know, whether or not we have maybe, an, say I'm making this up, but an IT expenditure, we know that could be critically important to their infrastructure. Um, you know, uh, you know, I don't know what we, we know on that front. So I'm not trying to take over the meeting, John, but I, I like the way that the school board kind of laid that out and said, you know, um, and, and, and they had a really good one. They're asking staff, what's it going to take for kids who've slipped in learning for us to get back to what might have been lost? We don't have that same problem they have, you know, in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, students, but do we have something with staff that's been impacted with COVID that we need to, we need to be thinking about? So I, I, I would just add my question now. So I, that's just my two cents, John. So. Well, I think I think I think it can be both, right, Betsy? To your point, I think I think having a percentage that we want to try and set to give to the town and schools is good, but I I think the guidance, kind of like you're saying, is probably just as important to kind of set some priorities or focus that we want to make sure as they develop their their budgets, they're thinking about those as like critical items, kind of like what the school board put together for us, where it's just like, consider these five things as you're developing your budget, because these are the things we wanna make sure we hear from you on. And then everything else, like just be aware that that's where there might be further discussion if we need to kind of look at reducing things to get to the mill rate goal. And, and maybe John, just to kind of um, understand a little bit what you said around spending, like I, I I don't know if, if we're going to be able to create a percentage increase in expenditures that we're comfortable with. I think it's more like the way I would think of it is like we want to set a target that we assume will, based on not knowing the revenues yet, but will get us to that 3% mill rate goal without having to like go through significant cuts. Like we want a realistic budget coming in the first read to kind of minimize the need for significant um you know trade-offs or things that are going to have to happen in order to get to that three percent mill rate because i don't know if if like without knowing the revenues it's kind of hard to say well is this really the expense that we want to see or is it is it you know there's there's some assumptions we're making about that at this point um Fair enough. I, and, and this is where I, I didn't come into this meeting with a, a predetermined outcome in mind. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm reasonably prepared to go down the path of, of setting some qualitative budget goals or targets. Um, it, you know, something along the lines that you, Betsy, you, you, you mentioned some and Sarah provided us with, with some of those as well. But, um, you know, the, the, the town took a hit last year. They really pent, you know, tightened their belt um, pretty hard. And I, I want to see that even out a little. Uh, I, um, but you know, equity is important to me. So that you know, from my perspective, that's something that I'm I'm looking to get out of this budget is something that let's leave, let's level the playing field a little bit so that you know our, uh, everybody's being treated fairly and and equitably because we we value all staff you know whether they're on the school department or um, or on the municipal side. So that, you know that's one of the. Um, uh, I, I guess key budget things that I'm looking for this year is I want to see some balance or equity um, in the budget. And whether we get there on first read, I, I think I'm going to be an advocate for getting there at the end of the day. Uh, anyways, and, and, and to remind everybody, we can't really control what's presented to us at first reading because um, the, the charter gives that authority to the, the school board and the town manager um, to start the process. But that doesn't mean we can't give some guidance on what we think will, will be reasonable. 
right? I mean, I, I also think, you know, something that's reasonably in line with historical trends, um, yeah, it's a good place to start. Um, so I don't know if you guys have any thoughts along those lines, whether we should be trying to hone in on specific numbers or more. Um, these are things that are going to, that we're going to be looking or judging the budget, budget against. I like your thought on specific numbers. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely want to hear what you've got working. Um, so I don't, I don't want mine to say like what I said about, you know, target high targets, you know, or, you know, what we're looking for to eclipse what you were saying. Cause I think we can do both like John said, and I think, that's a good place to start. Okay, so do we want to haul, you know, go down the qualitative path for a bit? Um, you know, going in, are there things that you expect, John or Betsy, to um, that you want to see uh, addressed with this budget? I think it's I think it's the same thing, similar to what um, the school board provided, John, and I think it's similar to what you were saying. Of like, step one is really, what did you defer last year? because it was a COVID year that you want to re-propose to get back to the same level of service that maybe we, we, we took a hit on purposely. And so I think making sure that we give them the opportunity to kind of bring that back for consideration, I think is something we, we should definitely allow in the first budget read so that we can evaluate and make sure that we don't want to defer those again. And I and, you know, better understanding, you know, maybe deferring one year um, was acceptable, but like, what's the impact if we were to defer again, just to make sure if there is a, you know, bigger impact to the town, if we go another year, like making sure that we understand that impact. Oh, and Liam, it sounded like maybe you were gonna uh, point out a few things, so. Well, I mean, just in the context of staffing, I mean, that, we, we, we all know that that's really a, a, a huge budget driver, um, more so probably on the school department side than the municipal side, but, you know, pay and benefits are, are really where a lot of those cost centers are. And um, just to remind, uh, I know, John, you, you weren't here through that process, but there were six positions that were vacant at the time of the budget was approved that we had deferred hiring for. Um, so there are six, six full-time positions on the municipal side that we, we obviously have plans that we have either filled or have plans to fill uh, before the end of this fiscal year that are going to need to be fully funded in FY22. So having those positions come online is, is certainly going to, I mean, that's just getting back to status quo. Um, we're obviously in the early stages of the budget formulation process on the municipal side, but there have been some conversations around, um, you know, again, that's just getting back to status quo, never mind um, trying to, to meet the needs, you know, expanding needs of the community, which again, necessitates some additional staffing. And so, um, you know, I think that we've, in the last few years, I think we've really done a good job of bringing some of those needs to the council's attention. Um, not to say that we're, they're, they're always supported or brought forward or approved, but there does seem to be a general tone from the council that they wanna, they wanna hear from uh, departments about you know, what the needs are to meet the, the community needs. And so um, I guess that would be my only um, concern is that you know, by, by you know, having a target out of the gate, um, some of those conversations don't happen um, because we're, we're trying to meet this, this first read goal. We, we all, and again, the council has been very clear as to what, where we need to get to ultimately. Um, and obviously there's no, it makes no sense to have a, an overly expansive first read goal where we know we're going to have to do a lot of hard work. Um, but I guess that's, that's the thing that's in the back of my mind. Um, how do we, how do we make sure the council is aware of where those needs are? Yeah. And then we I'm have, wondering, I'm wondering we, if there's, sorry, Betsy, just like, I'm wondering ahead. if there's a way to factor some of that in if we do decide to place like a numeric target, Liam, to your point, so that we could say, you know, we'll, we'll set a goal potentially, but that goal would be assuming, would be in addition to some of this um, level setting that maybe needs to happen to get back to level from last year. And I guess the question would be, would be if we did go down that path, like what would those specific things be 
that we would want to say, you know, that's kind of out of scope for the goal because we're assuming that those are things that we want to um, definitely not not have people not put forward because they're important to get back to to level services potentially. So I think that could be one angle we could consider. Have, have we hired all six of those positions? I know the firefighter positions. So it kind of has to do with when we actually put people in the position. So where, where do we stand on those six positions? Yeah, so uh, just to, to recap, two of them were um, uh, frontline public works positions. So we had deferred the hiring of those till November 1, again, before our winter season, when those are really emergent operations. We had a police a patrol officer position that we deferred till January 1. We have a, a contingent offer out on that, and I believe they're in the process of coming on board. We had um, uh, a grounds position, and we had two firefighter positions that were April 1 hires. Um, so again, deferring, so essentially nine months of salary and benefits will have to be worked into the budget in FY22 just to, to keep status quo. I guess the other the only other comment I'd make is that um, and again, I think this was probably two years ago now. Um, if it if it made it into the first read last year, it was a it was a short lived uh, notion. But we we have tried to provide narratives to the council for uh, what positions were discussed or are are really needed but didn't make the cut for the first read budget for the that the council weighed through. So we did generally try to provide that in a narrative format. Here's a position, here's what the justification is, here's what the cost is, just to kind of put those options and, and build that awareness, ideally to, you know, plan for the future. Um, and so we have done that in years past as well. That that may ultimately be a course we go with some of these asks, um, but that's an option. And collective bargaining agreements we have coming up. Yeah, we, we have uh, three that will expire uh, at the end of this fiscal year. We have another one, which is uh, an initial agreement. So, so theoretically, we're negotiating four collective bargaining agreements. Um, again, there will, be, there will be some funds set aside to settle those agreements, because uh, I, I do not expect they'll be settled by time uh, first read comes around in, in a little less than two months. Um, but that's another unknown that we need to plan for. Uh, for for staff too, and Ruth, I might be forgetting this from our meeting last week, but I thought there were some cases of staff that were also put down to part time. Um, is that something that's going to continue, or are we going to kind of try and get some of those part time that part time work back up to full time? I think it was during the month of July where we essentially put quite a few employees down to uh, instead of 40 hours a week, they were down to like 20 hours a week. And those savings in the budget were actually cut out of this year's budget. So those two weeks essentially of all of those employees will have to be worked back into the budget for next year. So we're kind of starting in a hole already for those two weeks. You know, if I can just add to that. So, so that's the other in addition to fully funding uh, some deferred hiring, we also will need to fully fund um, salaries for, you know, that that was the work share program, John, that, that we implemented. Um, it actually started in May, which was obviously FY20. Um, but we did use some of the savings that were realized through that, uh, that furloughing to bring forward into the FY21 year as a, as a fund balance. And so, you know, there, that was, you know, another 400 or so thousand dollars that we won't have in, in either savings or fund balance for FY22. So that, that, that's another um, challenge as we work through this budget process. And we eliminated, when the pandemic started, just flat out eliminated some part-time positions. Are those permanently gone, Liam? Or? Um, some of them, uh, again, a lot of them were, were furloughed. So they, uh, the, the programs that they were servicing uh, were temporarily discontinued. Child care, I think there were 31 in total. You know, 24 or five of them were before and after care staff for a school year that was no longer in session. Um, we had some other part-time. We, we brought back about half of the remaining 
Um, we have plans to, to fund, a, you know, again, for instance, a part-time position in, in finance that we plan on seeing funded. Uh, there's a part-time HR position that was discontinued. So about half of the permanent kind of regular part-timers uh, will come back or have come back. The other ones have been restored by virtue of before and after care programs, which has a revenue associated with it. That's a revenue generator. Um, those have been restored. Okay, thanks. So I've been trying to wrap my arm around the the dynamic the past couple of years has been the you know the council director has been to come in lean or we're going to make you lean right off the bat um, and I, I think before that there was a little more openness to tell me about your needs and uh, we're going to get to the same end point so both approaches are going to get to the same end point right uh, I guess where where's your preference in terms of do we want our guidance to be come in fat with a clear understanding that we're gonna to get to the end target of 3% uh, to, the, to the taxpayer, or come in lean, but being able to clearly articulate the needs that you're not meeting with that budget. I don't know which way is right, and I don't know that there is a right way, but I'd be interested if you have a preference for those. I have a preference for number two, only because, well, I shouldn't say only because, one reason because, um, it, it just the the other way really i think doesn't work well for the the public um you know and we, we can be critical and say oh they don't you know they're not paying attention or whatever but you know then you know the newspapers will print 10 percent tax increase you know like you know so and i'm not saying we would react only to the media but i really you know one of the pieces I think we're kind of missing from this conversation was the work that this committee does, because that stuff is going through this committee. Um, yes, the first read is, uh, you know, it's, it's a little different because we haven't had time to go through all of it. But at that point, you know, um, we do hear about things, um, you know, that people wanted and uh, we can ask for anything. I mean, even if Tom doesn't want to bring it forward, we can say, well, we want we want to talk to this person directly and you know did you did you give up a position and what do you think it's going to do i think um jc correct me if i'm wrong but i think we had some discussions on the um the pleasant hill fire station last year um because you know that was was a pretty impactful change in the mind of many people so um so you know there is work that gets done at this committee level too where we get to hear a lot of those. Last year, uh, I believe we had uh, we had at least one other counselor attend almost every single one of our meetings, and sometimes more if it was a hot topic. And the chair last year just let them participate almost like they were on the committee. So there was work that got done, you know, with um, other things that counselors were were concerned about as well. So for all those reasons, I am for. For number two, you know, let's let's start at what we think is realistic, um, but you know, offers up some choices and some tough decisions because there's going to be some tough decisions this year, um, and make sure that we feel comfortable asking, you know, the questions and and bringing in the, the department heads that we want to talk to directly and encourage our fellow counselors to participate in that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to think if there's like an option three that isn't like one or two. Cause again, like I, I think I'm, I'm leaning towards two like Betsy in terms of like try and come in realistic. But again, I just go back to like what I really want to know, like I want to, I want to be able to understand wants versus needs. And I think some of the things we just talked about in terms of people and things like that, like some of those are, are real needs and we need to understand what those are first. But then if there are other things that are also strategic and helpful, but again, might be things that have to in the future, you know, be deferred again, you know, I, I would want to give the both the schools and the town the ability to at least make their case. Um, just in terms of like what the value is there, because that that's going to be the only way I feel like later in the process we'll be able to at least on the town side make some decisions by understanding some of those those other things that they want 
So I don't know if there's like an option three where it's like, again, we want to, we want to encourage you to really be clear on some of those things that you need that are going to get us back to where we were pre COVID that are kind of really um, important and necessary. And then what are those other things that are not meeting the guidance that we may want to set that again, we want visibility to, but just be aware that those are likely going to be the things that we're going to might, might have to, to revisit first. Yeah, maybe like that narrative that Liam was describing to make sure that that's kind of almost hard, a hard copy so that people could see. So yeah. this is a, a, a purely off the cuff, not something that I've thought through all that much, but um, you know, it's not uncommon for them to come in with a like a high, medium, low type um, budget, or at least on the school side. Is that so? Again, I'm trying to drive towards equity. Is that something that we might want to see on the municipal and the school side? So, show me what a uh, three percent gross budget increase, four percent, five percent. Do we want to go down that path out of the get-go, or do we want to rely on um, the school department and uh, uh, Tom to kind of dictate how that comes to us? Well. My, I don't know, I, I don't see Tom ever putting in, I don't know what any wants would be, John. I mean, like, one of the things we, you know, we're not like, so we compl I complain a little bit sometimes we're not quite proactive enough, but on the other hand, you know, we're just very lean and then, you know, it comes up that we need something and then, you know, we got to deal with it, we got to fund it, we got to, you know, so, um, so maybe it has to do with understanding, you know, our longer term plans, like we've been talking about, um, you know, in a different forum than the budget. But I just, you know, I, I feel like Tom, you know, he, he pretty much comes in at, at, at what he, what he really needs. And then sometimes we'll say, look, this is, we want this new position and this is why we want it. And this is what we can't do if we don't have it. Um, and that may may certainly, you know, happen on the planning department side this year or something like that. So, well, maybe 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 wants first needs is a bad bad way to look at it. It's like there's the needs we have that are really to get us back to um, to normal, and then there are the additional needs that might be new investment decisions that we want to do because Tom or the school have identified a new need that wasn't there before that we need to assess. And so I feel like it's just trying to like really, you know, distinguish between the two to say like, there's, there's the need to kind of get back to where we were that we need to understand what are those. And then there are those additional needs that might be new investments for new, new problems or new opportunities that that the town and the schools want to explore. And I think just being able to understand the two of those, I think will just help us better as we kind of need to assess and make decisions yeah. going forward. And just about running lean, and just in my opinion, um, we say get caught up. I mean, a lot of what we did last year was defer. The, the I feel like where we maybe took the hits was on the capital because you know there's only so long you can run a certain dump truck you know before the thing just falls apart out on the road or a plow we didn't lay anyone off I mean if you look at Portland they laid off dozens of people literally laid them off right we, we really didn't lay anyone off um, we've restored the part-time positions we deferred like there were some people were supposed to get promotions we deferred some of that um, we did have a real impact on um, on the town side of people giving up increases for half the year. Um, so that was a real uh, cut that, you know, that's something that you want to see if somebody deferred something, then what is their starting point for what you're doing for increases? But I don't, I, I feel like, and then with Tom's creativity of laying off people half time and using the, the program available to him of the extra 600 a week coming from the federal government along with the unemployment and using that program, um, which any town manager could have used, um, but our town manager did, some didn't. So 
I don't know that, you know, we have a huge makeup. I, I could be wrong. It's my perception on the operating side in the town. Um, as, as I said, I think that's partially because we usually operate, you know, pretty leanly for, for this, for what we need. So um, the capital, I think, is the most concerning thing to me on the town side. Um, I think there's some big expenditures. No one has funded the turf field yet. Um, we did put off some, you know, some other things. So uh, the school side, you know, I've got my opinions on that, but. So um, I want to try to, let me read back to you what I just wrote down for um, potential candidates for budget goals. I, I, I lashed on to three. Uh, where we seem to agree, but you, you, you guys tell me is one, come in lean with a clear understanding of the unmet needs. Um, we want to see a first reading budget that restores planned capital improvements and restores deferred positions. Are we, are we aligned on that? Can you, can you read number one again? Yeah, uh, co well, come in lean with your budget with a clear understanding of unmet needs. Yeah, I mean, I think I think these are good general, you know, guide guide guidelines. Um, and then beyond that, some of this is semantics. If we already know that the it's going to result in a three percent tax rate, we, we don't necessarily need to show the tax rate at first reading um, because we don't know it yet. That, that's kind of what we have to. We're, we're going to have a gap that we need to close, or you know, maybe we'll have some pleasant surprises, but. Um, it's not really up to us, but it's, it seems like that's where the focus should be is um, on that gap as opposed to, because we already know the end, we're going to probably increase taxes 3%. But I don't know how to phrase a goal or a target that, that kind of gets at that, but maybe maybe it could be guidance to focus on the, uh, the deficit the, between spending and what we're going to collect on the, from the taxpayer. I don't know, Ruth, have you ever done it a little different, or phrased it a little differently? Um, no, I, not really. I think those are uh, good goals to start with. I just did want to make one point, if I could, regarding the operations. There were quite a few reductions in the operating budget. Um, for example, that work show that came to about $180,000. Departments reduce their new equipment lines, their supply lines, their training lines. Uh, oh, that's right. Yeah. There. Yeah. Thank and you. Those are all, you know, the, the departments are going to be looking to put hopefully some of that, if not all of that, back in. Yeah. Then, thank you very much. The three percent. So. Yeah. Thank you very much. That we that I slipped my mind. I I apologize. I was thinking personnel and capital, but yeah, there were definitely line items like that, especially training. So, but along the same line, so we're, I think we're in agreement that we want to see a first reading that gets us back on, gets the ship sailing again, right? Gets us back. And then let's make some real decisions after that about how we get from that point to, um, you know, the budget target that we already have established. And the, the last piece is, I know Tom always brings this up, is that when we first bring our budget out, you know, when Tom submits his budget, to the finance committee and the citizens and council it's not the final number and then even once the council goes through the whole process and they approve the budget it's still not the final number because it's the assessor yeah. who actually sets that tax rate and depending on what the new value is that comes in through the town i mean i think nick puts through our assessor puts through like an estimate and i'm sure he's lowballing it because he doesn't want to come in too high and then when the final comes in, you know, there's always, uh, it always tends to reduce the actual amount of the tax rate below the, like the 3% goal. Yeah, it's like a squishy ball to me, Ruth, where you, you squish on this thing, this pops out, but then you got to squish back to this. And in the end, it's got to be a round ball. <laughs> you know, but it's a, uh, yeah, I mean, we say, John, you know, we're not looking at the tax rate of first read. And, you know, we probably aren't as much, but I feel like Ruth and Tom are. <laughs> I feel like they're they're running that quite a bit and making estimates on revenue and, you know, trying to figure that out so that what what we get in the end is is uh, realistic. So, I think uh, that's a big part of their job is how to bridge the gap from what we're spending to what we're collecting from the taxpayer. It's a not an easy job. 
Right. Can we can we talk and maybe this is like too tactical, but I think it's an important call out because I know it's something that's happening with the turf field. I think it's being transitioned to the schools to include in part of their CIP. So just John, to your point in terms of like equity and fairness, like even though at the end of the day, that's the town budget that's being approved. You know, I just would want to make sure that we're being fair and considering that if that does need to go, or if we decide to put that to ballot, that that's not going to be something that then is going to impact the school budget overall. So I don't know how we want to handle that or set some clear guidance on how we're going to deal with the tour field since it's kind of a weird thing that's shifting from the town to the school for this year. So I, I, to me, it's semantics. And I, I don't know the, the background of why Tom wanted on the school side, but to me, I'm and I, I worked the schedule a little bit this way. There was the only comment that I had on the proposed schedule was so let's handle debt and capital improvements as one bucket at the end of the process. And, um, and then they, we'll pick it. And so it's going to be on that, that list that we see at the end. And if it makes a priority, then we'd send it to the, to the voters. But uh, I have a real issue with the way we're allocating um, debt service and to some extent capital projects. The, the school has no ability to manage their debt. We do that. So when we refund, we get the benefit of it and they're still stuck at 5% interest rates from 30 years ago or whatever. So uh, there, there's an inequity there that I think it just makes sense to handle. Um, and this is actually how we manage it anyways. We manage it as a town. We go. We only do one bond order. It's combined for school and municipal. So I, I view the two as combined. Um, yeah, uh, my understanding is that relates to state law and how they have to maintain their own debt to... I mean, at least conceptually, they have to maintain their own debt. But I totally agree. It would make so much. I mean, a school, look at all the purposes it's used for, like the physical facility, to be able to main, manage all of our capital as a town, as opposed to school and, you know, town, it would make some sense. You know, I'm sure there are any pluses and minuses to it. But my understanding is, like, as they have to do it that way because of state law. So I don't know. Ruth probably knows that far better than I, but. Yes, some of the schools do receive some uh, what they call construction aid, and depending on their needs, I don't think the town or the school department has received any in quite a while. Uh, the state also, in terms of their funding for their general purpose aid, they have to record that. For our tax rate comp page, however, we could put, here's the total capital like we do right now for school and town in one area. We could do that same thing again. We used to do it this way break out the school and town debt so it's all in one place. But we do do, when we do an advance refunding, we get new debt schedules. The school does also uh, receive the benefit of that reduction usually. So we, so their, their debt is based on what their actual costs are. I mean, the town doesn't see all of those savings on our own. So that's a- I, I, I just wanna be clear, clear as like, as we advance the turf, um, and the decision there that we somehow normalize that out of, or like, how, how do we make sure that it's not a conversation of the school budget went up 6% where, I, where two percentage percentage points of that is really because of the turf. So really they've only gone up 4%. We've just made a decision that we're putting the turf in the school's budget for this year. Like I just, just the optics of it, you know, just wanna make sure that we recognize that if we're moving the turf to the school's budget, that if it goes forward, that there should be some some acknowledgement that 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 was done deliberately, and that you know, it's really to your point, John. I think it's a it's really a capital project for the entire town. It's just it's just kind of accounting of where it's going. But I just that just concerns me a little bit. And that goes back to the. Um Again, Tom and the school department have been working on a facilities management essential department, if you will. And right now the school's kind of doing their thing and, and we're trying to do something on the town side. So um, I think that's that could be a way to try and manage the, the facilities and all of the grounds and related items. So um, John, in terms of equity, um, I read through the stuff sent by the schools and I certainly could have missed something, but um, one place that they tend to have a bigger bucket of money is, is a reserve fund because um, it, 
they tend to, so this is, it seems like, you know, they're, they, they ensure where we run very close to exactly what we're going to spend, they will kind of maybe run a little higher. They do that on purpose. They keep it in reserve in case they need it. Maybe they have some expenses. Well, they do, right? Because they, they might have two or three extra special, you know, different types of needs. I won't say what they are, but they could have needs unanticipated that something happens in the year. So it's the way they run it, which is, you know, under, you know, is fine. Um, I didn't really see, you know, with the COVID, the one big thing we did see was they had a lot of their budget was unspent and they did apply that last year, you know, to bring the, to bring the budget down, not the whole thing, but some big portion of it. One of the big uh, things this year, and, and you, it was very good of you to bring this budget order here, which was great, was that we did attribute 500,000 to COVID when the state just continually did not tell anybody what they were gonna get. And as soon as all the budgets passed, then the state came out and said, oh, Scarborough, you get $2 million for COVID or however that worked. So, you know, one of the things that was my understanding was that, you know, we would be receiving all receipts related to COVID. And then if there was federal or state money, that that money would be used first um, because our money, while we put it in a quote unquote bucket, we had no strings on our money for the schools. So they were able to use that money how they need their strings on the other money. Um, but my, my perception was, you know, the other money would get spent first. So I guess I'm still really interested in first read at understanding what might be there for reserves on the school side. And, and I, think they'll, I, I think they'll definitely show us. So the school department has some different constraints than, than, than we do. Whereas if they over, they can't overexpend their budget without going back to the voters for coming back to us and then us going back to the voters for approval. So they um, rightfully build a cushion in. And then uh, there's also a statute that controls how much of that cushion they can carry from year to year. So they do, it's kind of like a planned release. There's you know, almost every year for the past couple of years, they've released some, um, uh, fund balance. And I, I, I think Kate did get back to us that she anticipates some of that being available again this year. Uh, and we'll see exactly how much, but uh, uh, so I, I guess I lost my train of thought. I, I think we will see at first read what the, it's part of the budget book, what, you know, what is there for fund balance and then the anticipated use of it. And particularly that, that COVID money that we set aside. So when Ruth was talking about you know, where I didn't say it correctly, and I really appreciate that, you know, with some real cuts, 188000 on the town side, training, supplies, things like that, you know, and that definitely went to that $500,000 bucket, which all of us believed that the state and the federal government were going to provide some money. We just had, we had no indication of what that might be. It turned out to be $2 million plus dollars. So I'd really like to get an accounting on that. And, you know, that would be you know, a help to the town and the taxpayers to say, hey, we didn't have to spend that money, you know, um, or COVID relief because we got the relief. And I'm not saying that's the case, but if that is the case, it, you know, it, it might be that there were so many strings on the other things, the real things they needed to do weren't paid for. I, so I, I'm perfectly happy with an explanation. I just really want to see, you know, how that went. Um, because, uh, you know, I'll be real honest, if it, it, you know, <laughs> I, and I have no reason to say this, but it felt like, and it probably wasn't, but it felt like a little bit of a bait and switch by the state. You know, they, they really, I mean, it was almost like as soon as every, every town passed their budget, they came out with, oh yeah, here's what you're getting for COVID for the schools. And it's like, wow, you know, so it was, it was a little bit of a hard pill to swallow, but anyway, um, you know, good Kenzie, to learn. if I can simplify this, Liam, can you scroll up to the uh, one page up actually? Um, so we did call out the 500,000, the 533. We also call, called out the municipal reductions, right? And uh, to me, when you're building next year, don't build it off of you know, your gross budget plus the 533. You're going to build it off of your gross, the, um, the, the 52777, not the, uh, the 53311, right? And, uh, but similarly, on the town side, don't necessarily build it off of those to be distributed reductions, build it off of, you know, where you had anticipated you were going to be. 
Again, I can't control, we can't necessarily control what the school spend, spends their money on or how they spent it last year. And to some extent, it's going to be, it's just how we accounted for different things. But we can control how much we allocate next year. I guess my strider, starting point is, again, not knowing everything, prior to the 533 being allocated. I wouldn't build off of that number. I don't know if we need to call that out as a goal. Do you, uh, uh, or do you think it's already okay. pretty well understood? I would want to call that. Personally, I'd want to. Can call I just make sure I understand? We... Yeah, you want to say it back, John? So, so are we saying that this five thirty three was money that was cut from the town and given to the school? So we're assuming that that money goes back into the town for next year as part of our what we consider to build off our our next year's budget? Or I guess, yeah, I guess I'm just not following what, what I understand what the 533 was, but how are we trying to account for it going forward? I'm still, that's still not we, clicking for me. We may be getting a little detail, too detailed too, because if we get that specific about one number, it can just throw out, I, I think our general guidance with, you know, at first reading, restoring deferred positions and restoring the plan capital improvements it doesn't matter what it was last year. Well, yeah. I think I think the general guidance, you know, might be to um, um, I'm going off the top of my head, but to uh, um, it's not restore, but you know, ensure that all um, COVID funds were used for COVID relief before um, town funds were expended. So, um, you know, to account for, you know, so, it, it, you know, at the, at the point in time, so if we, you know, we talk one budget, one town, but, you know, if, if we do have this budget, we have this budget deficit to kind of make up where we, we definitely took a bigger hit than the schools did. Um, on the town side, um, on all levels, you know, personnel increases, um, supplies, training, and a part of it was this half million dollars. Um, so uh, uh, if, if we could understand, you know, how that's going, again, I'm not, you know, they may have had to spend it, and that's what it was there for, and there may be perfectly good reasons for that. So I guess, you know, the guidance would be just to do it if possible. Um, I did just see something pop up that said Sarah's on watching. So she she has a comment if somebody. I'm perfectly fine with her weighing in on this. She's saving me from myself, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, you want to go ahead and let Sarah in? Uh, Sarah, do you, want, if, do you want to weigh in? You're welcome to. I can either promote you to a panelist. Just raise your hand if you'd like to chime in. Otherwise, we can. Oh, she's. I'm just seeing the message as well. That's it. Hey guys, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, no worries. I, I figured it might, I was going to send you an email afterwards, anyways, Betsy. Um, but just to explain a little bit the, the, the process. So the money that we've gotten from um, grants, whether it's the ESSER grants or the CRF grants, we've we do have detailed sort of summer charts that are available. And I think I, li I link them or they're either linked in another document, but I'll make sure that you have direct access to those Betsy afterwards so you can look through them. And it, and it has line item detail as to what we had applied for, um, what we've spent, and then what's kind of remaining that will be spent over the course of the, the remainder of the year. And the, the key thing to know about those is that they were um, supplemental to what we had in the budget. So we couldn't use them to replace anything that was already in our budget. So the very quick answer to your question is we, we did, we have spent or planning to spend the $500,000, um, you okay. know, a little bit more, the 533000 um, in addition to what we receive as grants, but we couldn't replace, we couldn't use the grant money to sort of backfill the money that was given to us by town. 
Does that make sense? It makes sense. And it's typical of okay. any kind of federal yeah. state money having tons of strings. So that's why I, yeah. you know, I wanted yeah. to um, couch it to say we don't really know. And uh, but yeah, that's very helpful. The one um, sort of nuance to that is that there. So most of the spending had to be spent by the end of December. And at, at kind of the last minute, they said, actually, um, we're going to extend the timelines for, for some of these grants so they can actually be used to um, support your FY22 budget. So you will see some information, um, some money carried over from those grants into the FY22 budget. Um, and then there's also the possibility, right, that we get more um, from the state of Fred's. But I think we're going to run into a very similar situation this year that we did last year, which is we might be get we might get pretty far down the budget process before um, we know what those numbers are going to look like. Well, it's good to know how many strings they had. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. I had a detailed question. You're welcome. I'm not going to ask it unless <coughs> unless John gives the okay. So I'm going to I'm going to wait. Um, for that. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Betsy. Uh, so you detailed out something about the nutrition budget. So, um, so it, it seemed like there was COVID money for making meals for people, but that wasn't normally the normal way we do it, which is we only have reduced lunches and, and breakfast plan, and those get supplemented by the government, and then everybody else pays some to get things. But so what, what do you feel like is happening with the nutrition budget? So I'm going to hope to get this right, and then I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that it's included in any presentation that Kate gives to sort of qualify anything I've said. But um, in, the, in the past, we have received money, you know, from the state to help with um, meals. This year, because of COVID, it's a mandate that, you know, we provide – uh, it's it's a mandate, but also I think it's a, sort of an ethical responsibility, right? We're providing meals to to students, um, whether they sort of need them or not. Um, but it's an un, it's an unfunded mandate, right? So it's not completely funded. So that means we're covering some of those costs. And the other thing is we're actually, you know, if you guys remember, um, I think it was two years ago now, we we withdrew from the. Um, federal nutritional program at the high school level because we felt that we could provide you know similar meals of quality but also it was an opportunity to get some revenue um, and so we we did that with the intention of trying to get to hoping to see some revenue come in from the nutritional program this past year um, but obviously that didn't happen so you will see a deficit most likely in our nutritional budget just due to the, the circumstances from this year. So people who um, normally would have paid for lunch at school were able to get them for free this year, is right? If they chose to. If if they chose to, that's correct. Did you yeah. guys put anything out asking people for donations or because it might have been just a convenience factor where, hey, I can go get meals for the week for my kids. This is awesome because I'm super busy and I'm running school and all that. And it's a great mm -hmm. help for parents, but I don't really need the money type thing. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a topical question. We actually had had this discussion at our finance committee earlier this week. Um, and I, I think the answer to that, you know, no, we have not sp explicitly asked for donations. Um, I think maybe there was a consideration of putting some sort of communication out there, but I think we have to be really careful on the wording of that, right? Because we don't want people to feel um, obligated. Uh, so I, I think that's something that, that's in progress, but we haven't done that to date yet, Betsy. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Thank You're you, welcome. Sarah. Yeah. Thanks. You're Sarah. welcome. I, I think this brings up a good point, and I don't know, John, if we need a fourth item or if it's just like a sub bullet on your first one about articulating, making sure that they can understand or we can understand the needs. But with the whole COVID uncertainty piece, still knowing that there's likely, like, I don't know if the town or the school will still have unique needs for next year to address, you know, public health matters related to COVID that we need to kind of just make sure we consider as we go through this. So I don't know if there's something that we wanna call out or again set like another principle around that, knowing that again, still a lot of uncertainty and we're, we're gonna have to like do something I'm sure, but I, we're, we're kind of making a lot of guesses right now because we don't really know what's gonna happen. You wanna take a stab at it? 
Oh, I was hoping you would. You're much better at this than I am. <laughs> um, I need to give that some thought. Um, so it, are we already saying that, or, or do we want to be explicit about uh, uh, I, I think I understand where you're going. So we want you to come in, Lane, with a clear understanding of unmet needs, but also what's going to be required to provide a safe environment for our staff, students, and um, whoever else, you know, and the public that might be on our grounds. Something along those lines? Yeah. yeah, something along those lines that just really indicate that, again, there's, and again, maybe maybe we feel good enough this year that with all the investments that we've made and everything the school's gotten, that they feel pretty, pretty solid going into next year, that they don't need more investment to to accomplish that but i do think that could be a you know non-normal cycle type investment that we just need to consider for next year as well potentially that might further inflate the budget because we have to do those things yeah I don't know I if that makes a sense. really good call out because um you know everyone did a really really good job but you know i don't I mean, are there things like ventilation systems, which could be a huge amount of money? Um, it's it's worth making sure that we kind of separate that into a different bucket so people can understand what the town and the school is up against. Let me read this back to you and, say, and tell me if you think it, it hits it. But um, So our, our first target or goal would be to come in lane with a clear understanding of unmet needs and what will be required to provide a safe environment for our staff, students, and the public. I like it. I can live with it. I would say safe. Um, I think we already do safe, but safe is good. I would say um, and safe and or mandated or, you know, because so much of what we end up having to do is, is mandated. It's not. It's compliant. Compliant. Yes, I like that. Perfect. Okay. I, I, uh, I'm fairly comfortable with going out with this guidance for first read. Uh, well, I worry started, about- John, I, I you worry, said you had some numbers in mind. I'm dying to hear your numbers. <laughs> I, I, actually, no, I, I don't. So, okay, I've done a lot of work to try to understand where I think things should be relative to, um, you know, natural trends. Uh, but I, uh, what I don't want us to do this year is fight over the meaning of 3%, right? We're, that's established. We're going to probably, your tax bill is probably going to go up 3% next year. Um, but let's fight about where we're allocating the resources, the, the funding, and, and how we're paying for it. We never have a discussion about increasing our fees or managing things that way. Uh, I, just, I, I think we tend to focus on one piece of the whole pie, and I'd rather spend a little more time this year, especially given... Um, COVID and the situation we're in, talking more about, you know, where's the money going, um, what needs are being met, and are there opportunities for efficiency or shifting or, or, or whatever? I just, I feel like we don't, we don't dive into that conversation deep enough a lot of times uh, because we're worried about the 3%. I think we've already settled the 3%. Unless somebody comes back and, you know, the math doesn't work. We can't make it work. Well, we had a double whammy last year with COVID and the reval, because we were coming in on the first year after the reval as well. So for many taxpayers, it wasn't a 3% increase that they had already had a 10, 15, 20% increase when they got their reval. So, um, you know, those people are still really impacted, but at least it's cleaner this year, you know? <laughs> Um, so, I mean, I, I don't want to minimize what a large over 60% of the town went through with that, but, um, you know, it's, uh, it's cleaner this year. Um, so if, I, I mean, do you guys have anything further to add, you know, in terms of the, the goals or target discussion? Go ahead, Liam. I guess I'm, I, I'm, I'm not clear as to, um, you know, I, I can appreciate that this is not the this is not the year of fulfilling a wants list. Um, but I, I appreciate that there's a receptiveness to having a conversation about needs. You know, that may fall may fall outside of what we can have the capacity to fund. Um, 
But, you know, it seems like the, the general conversation has been about what, what the world perhaps looked like pre-COVID and, and what, what, what steps were taken last year to, to make the budget work. Do you think it's a, um, so I guess I'm struggling with what the, what the definition or how we should interpret the, the term lean um, and what, what, how we sort of extrapolate that down or bring that down to provide guidance to, to town staff and, and as they work to build their budgets. Is there any value to going through an exercise of looking at FY20, you know, what the, what the FY20 budget looked like as a, as a, a point of reference and in terms of rest, restoring some of those, um, you know, supply lines, training lines, other things like that as a starting point. I mean, so there's some basis for it. I don't know what that would look like. I, I, I don't know how lean that would be, but at least there'd be a rationale that we could say, you know, here's, here's what the impact of COVID was. Here's what it would take to bring us back to status quo. And what does that look like? And I don't know if that I don't know what that would look like. I don't know if that would be 4% or 6%. I, and certainly, you know, if it looks like it's trending in something that's astronomical, then, then I expect Tom would, would rein that in. But that's something that people can latch on to, and it might be worthwhile for the council to appre- or the finance committee to appreciate. So I, I wanted to segue this into a bit of a discussion on our um, second uh, town council goal, which, which was included, improving the availability of uh, finance information. I was going to share my screen for that, if you allow oh, yeah. it. And I think I might cover, so I'm going to show you what I'm going to look at, right, after you give us the budget and what I'm going to be open with the, the finance committee about sharing. And it's just, it's a framework or a way that, that uh, I'm used to looking at things. So, uh, oh, I can share my screen. All right, let me. I'm still new to this. So I said, I share my whole screen. Then you can see my whole screen. Can you see me? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. So where to start? And then I love how the little drop down kind of hides my tabs. That's interesting. You can drop that to the bottom too with the little arrow. The arrow. If you uh, hover over your, your sort of Zoom screen, it has an option to drop the... Uh... I think that I just did. Okay, so where, where to start with this, right? This is last year's budget book. Uh, it is very detailed. At the end, it has individual line item appro- appropriations. And on the left, there's some codes. And then there's a description for the line that you're looking at. And, you know, this is... 100 pages, 150 pages of, of the budget book. Um, to, it's really hard to understand unless you're looking at a granular level. What I did was I took these codes and these roll-ups and I tried to make some sense of them. So some of them relate to wages. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out how to get around my screen. And excuse the oh, ton of data. Okay. So this is a summary of what's in the budget book. But I look at I looked at like the past five years. And if you bring things into like wages and benefits, you can see well how things have trend trended. And I see you, so I don't actually see 2021 in here, but um, I'm comparing what was proposed with the budget, what what the final budget adopted was and what the actuals were. And this gets pretty granular, right? Um, from a council level, we don't necessarily need that level of granularity, but there's a this specificity around what we're spending on supplies versus maintenance versus ut- utilities would be nice to be able to roll up if we're going to be coming up with some canned or standard reports. So. The other side of the equation, so those are like your cost centers, right? What you're, what you're spending money on. The, the other side is how are you organized? How are you structured? And what, uh, you know, what's your span of control? Right now, this is what we determine, right? This budget order level of detail. So honestly, I don't feel like we really manage it to that level today, but it is what it is. That's what we set. 
right? We kind of defer to Tom to manage the municipal side for the most part. Um, but you can look at things at a higher level than the budget order, right? So if you look at it, you know, if you roll it up for municipal, I took, I stripped out debt, um, education, the capital. We have a couple of things to get to our overall capital budget that um, I don't know if they belong there. They probably belong someplace else, but they're extraneous right now to anybody else's budget. And that's the senior property tax relief, the county, and what we spend for TIF CAs and whatnot. Um, but if we, something to think about, I guess, is what level is digestible for us as a council to uh, receive information like this uh, right here? This is a, uh, you know, looking at historical trends. Okay, so I'll walk you through a graph, right? This is your gross budget um, and how it's trended over time and how I project it'll trend in the future. If you look at 2021, it, it was really flat, right? So I, I'm projecting that we're gonna, if you drew, were to draw a line here, 2022, we're probably gonna come in somewhere as close to there. Um, plus or minus a little bit, but um, that's if, if it comes in and we're way up here, then we're probably going to have some issues. And same thing, if it comes in really flat again, I, you know, I, I think that's probably not necessarily fair to um, the community or staff either. So um, in terms of your, if you want to get specific with targets, which, which actually I'm kind of comfortable with the, the three that we outlined, you know, if you look at over the past three years, the, you can do mill rate. It's not just what you're trying. You can look at things relative to your the value of your properties in town right and it doesn't have to just be the net portion that you're asking of the taxpayer you can look at your total spending it actually makes more sense to look at your total spending relative to your value because the two tend to move together over time but on the municipal side the three-year gross mill rate changes about negative two and a half percent on the school side it's negative one and a half percent if you if you look over a longer period of time you know it's it's over the past seven years, our mill rates in, increased. Or this year's, what I'm forecasting for next year would be about um, half a percentage point higher than what it was seven years ago. For the for the municipal side, on the school side, it's about one and a half percent higher. Um, so the the schools have been trending, or their costs have been escalating more quickly than on the municipal side, and I think that should be leveled out with what we come back to for this year's budget. So I'm more at three percent. Um, on the municipal side for, for where I expect things to come in over last year, and about two and a half percent on the on the school side. Now you might come in at five percent and six percent, okay? But at, at the end of the day, I think for us to get to a three percent mill rate change, we're gonna be closer to these gross numbers. Um, but I don't really wanna put them as part of guidance or a goal. I think, uh, I, I think what we went out with with these three probably gets us close enough. And I think I'm pretty confident that we're gonna end at the right place. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys have thoughts on that, John or Betsy. I'm, I'm comfortable. I just wanna make sure we're addressing Liam's concern. So where, where Liam, you're looking for maybe more specificity. Can you just, can you just restate again what, what you're looking for that we can kind of figure out what we need to do to get more specific? Well, so, so I think that uh, historically, and again, I can appreciate that this isn't the exercise that, that the committee wants to go through this year, but historically it's been a, a, a figure, right? 6% first read, 3% second read approved budget. Um, you know, for better or worse, that's something that's very tangible. Um, I think that if you can, John, I apologize. Can you just repeat what the, the guidance is or what, what the motion is right now for guidance? So the, uh, the, the, the three targets or guidance, yeah. Um, so the, the first was to come in lean uh, with a clear understanding of unmet needs and what will be required to provide a safe and compliant environment for our staff, students, and um, the public. Uh, the second was that we want to see restored, uh, a restoration of planned capital improvements and a restoration of deferred positions. Okay. So, what I don't have an answer for is what's that going to equal? I don't know. There was a fourth one about the COVID compliance. I, I, I included that with the first bullet. Okay. So, uh, to provide a safe and compliant environment for our staff, students, and 
uh, the public. Okay. So would, would, the, would the committee consider uh, some additional gui guidance about restoration of, of those other line items that, that were uh, curtailed or cut in the process of the FY21 budget process? Or is that, or, or is that, is this message loud and clear that that's not something that this committee wants to, to see as the first read? Uh, I, I actually was looking at it the opposite way, so I'm glad you asked the question. I was more, I, I want to see a restorative budget. Okay. okay. That doesn't mean we're going to end with that. Correct. Yeah. But, but that gives us, that's, that's guidance that I think the, the, the departments can understand. You know, what does a restored budget look like? Obviously, it's going to go through the process. All of those are going to need to be understood. But that's where I was getting to the, the sort of the pre-COVID uh, operations. What did that, what does that look like? And um, that's something that I think that we can work from. Um, in addition to the, obviously there's, there's components, there's the deferred positions, there's the capital, and then there's also the other operational expenses. And I, I expect that if that is a number that's really scary, and I, I, and I have no idea what that number will look like, I expect that there will be some reductions before it reaches this committee. Um, but that's something I think is, is palatable for people. Well, and, and that's where there's some discretion that comes in, right? It, if, if it's really crazy, then just make sure they're clearly documented and that we're at least made aware of where the gaps still are. And I think that that does also place an emphasis on uh, getting back to, you know, again, forgive, forgive the term. I'm sure that this is, this is stepping on mine here, but you know, sort of what the status quo looked like. And then I appreciate the, the committee's desire to understand where those additional, and I would characterize them as new needs are. Um, and again, for, for, if nothing else, conversation and consideration, but let's focus on, on restoration. On some level. I think that's a good theme. It's not all that exciting or sexy, but <laughs> but it's important and, and yeah. a lot of things aren't all that exciting and, and sexy about municipal government. I'm not looking to, to change that uh, dynamic at this point. Betsy, are you okay with that? Um, so I yeah I think so. Um, I think uh, so you're, I think we, we had one viewpoint at the beginning though. So if, if the restoration budget, and I'm not sure what the school would consider to be their restoration budget, in some ways they did things differently than we did, but I know they did a lot of cuts too, right? By the time we saw their budget, they'd already gone through and done a lot of cuts. So, um, you know, if that does come in at, you know, 10% on the school side and 8% on the town side, are we comfortable having that be the public first read? Um, or did we want to have a target? You know, so should we set a, like a, a high cap or something like that? Like what if, you know, don't let your yeah, growth block by more than 5%. You know, right, I mean, you know, we can, we can do it however we want and, you know, in the end, you know, people do need to be engaged and understand the process. So I'm not, I'm not removing that, but you know, there is also, you know, concern um, that happens when those, those high numbers, you know, come out. I, th I think Tom's initial budget was before we made even any COVID cuts last year. So <laughs> people were, were having a heart attack, but anyway, I mean, that's just, it's one factor. Um, so, it, you know, is there, is there a high end, you know, that, that we don't want to see any, any more than X for first read? I think that's reasonable. What, do you want to toss out a number? Um, yeah, I would say 6% um, for both. So gross, um, you know, what I worry about is then we're going to see all, we're going to see 6%. We're going to have, you know, a lot of work in front of us to get back to three. Uh, yeah. But I, uh, yeah, so I don't know. I, I, I don't know where I'm at with this one. Are you talking 6%, for example, on total expenditures or on the net? We were talking 6% on, or I was referring to expenditures. I don't know where you were, Betsy. But the 3% uh, is on the, the net, right? That's right. Okay. Yeah. You mean after revenues? Right. Right, yeah. Well, the 3 percent's mill rate. We're, we're, 
Well, I think it's really hard for the school to do mill rate. I mean, they don't have any revenue hardly. So when we when we tell them mill rate, it's really a budget number for them. So, Liam, if we give gross budget guidance, say like you know, keep it within five percent of last year, six percent of last year, is that helpful or does that hurt things? I, I think it's helpful for. I guess I look at the guidance as being kind of two layers here. I think that the the, the guidance to the departments who are in the process of formulating budgets as we speak is. Uh, the, the sort of the theme is what is a restoring the, the cuts that were made last year to bring the budget to where we got to. That's sort of the theme. That's the expectation. And, and anything new that wasn't, uh, you know, needs to be clearly spelled out and for, for discussion. I think the 6%, I think something more tangible is, is easier to understand and plan for at, at sort of the managerial level, right? So he's going to have that in the back in the back of his mind about where, what that expectation is for the committee. And does that restoration budget, again, what does that look like? Is that well above that? So then additional work needs to be done at the, at the town manager level, or I think it, I think it's helpful. I just think it's used in, I think that guidance is used in two different ways. And, it, you know, I've always been on the fence about the first read, second read thing. I mean, uh, you know, what we could do, John, maybe is say, look, you know, that the, the second read goal is 3%. I mean, and and leave it at that. I mean, everyone knows that, but just to reiterate the goal of the second read. Or, or qualify the first, you know, if we want to say, you know, cap it at 6%, I think there there should be a clear understanding. I don't know that 6%, it, 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 there's probably going to be some required cuts to get from a 6% first read to a, a 3% net second read. Uh, can't say that for sure, but I, I just want to level set expectations that just because you hit 6% doesn't mean that we're, we're going to get there. Yeah. I mean, maybe I, this is what I, I, I'm not so worried about setting the target unless like Liam said, it's, it's really helpful. But again, when I think of it, like I want to know what is the percentage increase for um, restoration? What does that look like from a budget perspective? And then what are those, other things that are going to come in that are other needs outside of the restoration and where does that get us and i think that's to me being able to like see that net where we could see okay the town comes in it is eight percent overall but three percent of that is restoration and five percent of that is um new things i think that then gives us a better starting point for conversation around okay where do we need to make some changes if we feel like restoration is the priority. Um, I, I would be comfortable with that rather than like having to say it come in at 6% because I want to, again, I want to know what does it take to get to restoration, which doesn't mean we're going to do all of it. And what does it take or what else is needed, which doesn't mean you're, we're going to do all of that either. But at least it kind of gives us a, a way to assess it to say, you know, what are the restorative asks versus the, the additional asks. And, and maybe it's just framing and it's a more mature way to go about it in a way um, because the, you know, the school has laid out some guidance on their side, um, you know, but, you know, as, as the discussions go forward to, to frame it as restorative with the goal of 3% in the end, but we need to figure out how we're going to get there. So that's what we want to see. Yeah, and again, I think that the, the value to having kind of that cap is just, uh, one, I think it, it potentially, it, it caps the amount of work that this committee needs to do, right? Um, you know, I think that, and I, I certainly think that those those things, if, if a restorative budget is in excess of whatever the cap is, certainly those can still be identified and discussed. Um, but I think it, it, gives, um, it gives staff the ability to, uh, prioritize uh, some initial cuts to, to give something realistic uh, to work from. Again, realistic out of the gate to start for the community to start their work. I just also want to point out that Miss um, Layton has her hand up. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I didn't see that. I, uh, let, let's see what Sarah has to say. Thank you. I, I kind of put it up and wasn't really sure if 
<laughs> if you guys wanted me to keep jumping in here, but I really appreciate you al allowing me to. I just, um, I think what where you guys are right now, you know, is is kind of what we were hoping for and we're would be really supportive of. Um, and I totally understand where Liam's coming from. I I think, uh, I guess maybe just one caution I would throw out is when we when we do set specific first, um, if you're going to set specific first reading targets, um, I think it should, one, it should be on net budget, um, not gross. And two, um, if we, if you set a, a net budget target with, you know, with the intention that, you know, you may take some things that are over it or you may go under, there sometimes spins up a narrative in town that's like, the school or the town came in way over the goal or we didn't hit the goal or this and that. And it's just, unpro it's just not productive. Right. When ultimately we're all going to get to the same thing, which is that second reading goal of 3%. Um, so that, that would be my only caution, but I think how Betsy just phrased it earlier is right is show us what, what restorative looks like. And then knowing that we're going to get to 3% eventually. That, that's all I want to say, but thank you for bringing me in. Yeah, the only other thing I would add to that, I guess, John, is to your your point of of equity. Is is there anything that that we want to say at this point that we're prepared to say? And I'm not sure we are. You know, um, I think the couple of years that they did the the goal, or maybe at least just one year that they did the uh, the goal for the first read. Um, the goal for the school first read was much higher than the goal for the town first read, and we know that this is the way it comes out and. It is always going to be that way because all the revenue is realized, almost all the revenue is realized by the town, not by the school. They have the state revenue and that's it. So, um, and we have excise tax revenue sharing, homestead exemption, you know, so it is always going to be that way. But in John um, Clucci, is there something in your mind that you had when you said you kind of want to see this get more even that would make sense for a top percentage for first read, or would you rather tackle that at second read? Um, so tracking that budget is just a highly flawed way of, of, of trying to look at things. There's a lot of embedded in assumptions there that um, you're assuming that your revenue is going to continue outpacing your expense growth, and that's not necessarily a a valid assumption. So all right. things being equal, we got staff on the town side, we got staff on the municipal side. There, unless there's a gap you're trying to fill, you would expect them to grow at relatively comparable rates. Um, so, yeah, it, I mean, it's. Uh, I don't mind throwing out a, a, a high level cap, but my concern is it's everybody's going to come in at that. Uh, but the on the, the other side of it is if we don't put some parameters around it, then Tom's probably going to come in tight again and school's probably going to come in uh, with a needs-based budget. Um, we're going to have some of the same fights that we have most years. So I don't have a perfect answer, uh, but I, I, I will say that at the end of the day, I'm going to be trying to achieve a balance or equity between the municipal and um, school side, and maybe that's a way we could frame it, is we want to see things on a comparable basis between the town and school. And then Tom and Sandy can work out what that means. Uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm lost. I was starting to add a, a, you know, a fourth bullet for a gross budget cap. Um, I'm not sure that it's a good idea. And there, but I'm trying. I'm still trying to think through. Is there another way for us to frame it or phrase it that gets at the dynamic we're trying to we're trying to avoid this year? I mean, I think it goes back to what Liam said of like, how do we define lean? Like, what does the lean mean when we say come in lean? Because I think the restorative piece will be what it is, right? And it's that lean component where we're trying to say, you know. That, that's where I see the, the potential to really kind of have a lot of new needs. Um, but again, at the same time, like John, I think you've kind of said this a few times, like 
part of this is going through the process, right? Like we 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 want to hear what the town needs, and then we have the rest of the budget process to ultimately get to the ultimate goal, which is to make sure we we stay within that three percent mill rate goal. And so, again, I, I I'm personally comfortable with us not having to have the a fourth one or give something specific and keep it somewhat vague with lean as and and you know trust um tom and his staff and the school to to get the message that hey this this can't be you know outrageous not that that i would anticipate that anybody would do that purposely but like um i i think part of this has to be we have to like trust the process of the budget itself and know that we're going to work through it um, to your point john and i'm i'm comfortable with that i totally get the the um the risk we're trying to avoid i think with like public perception but i think that's more on us to communicate up front and and help set the stage at that first reading and re-emphasize some of these these principles that we just need to make sure the public understands that hey you know this this is also going to be an interesting year um, like last year where we had to make some tough choices. We want to kind of explore what it might look like to get back to restoration and understand new needs. So it might be another, you know, interesting year because we want to kind of really understand what we need to do differently. And I think, you know, I'm comfortable with the three we've outlined and just kind of going with that. Well, that's what I was suggesting with the three, but on the first one, you know, saying with the, end goal of net 3% or in goal of 3% um, mill rate increase. Just, yeah. Just to emphasize that, 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 that is where we're, where we're going. I think, like you say that, you know, you know, restorative or lean, whichever way we go with the wording on there. Um, I think restor restorative kind of does indicate lean, but um, maybe it does to some and, and it doesn't to others. Um, uh, and, um, you know, the only other thing, and maybe there is nothing, but the only other one we didn't really talk about is if there's, you know, a list of anything that people feel they could give up, you know? Um, so I know Tom gets to that and, you know, I, I don't know, cause I'm assuming this is kind of a guidance for VOE and for the town, cause that's what people have asked for. So, you know, um, it would be good from my standpoint to understand, you know, things that people feel could be delayed or, or even given up. So that's, you know, we've only talked about restorative and new needs and desires. Um, at some point, surely there's some things that end up being able to retire them or, you know, we don't need this as much as we did, or the spending is done in this area. It would be kind of good to understand those, but. Um, That's an important conversation <clears throat> to have, Betsy. I'm not sure exactly how to frame it in the context of what's presented for the budget. Because if you're a manager and you come to me with something that you say you don't need, I'm going to be like, what are, you, what are you doing? Why didn't you already take care of that? Um, right. Uh, it's a complicated one. It's tricky. I also think that's part of the process, right? I mean, we're going to start from a point which which likely will be in excess of, of what would amount to a 3% mill rate increase. And, and that's that's part of the exercise. You know, what what is uh, what is redundant? What could be more efficient? What could be? Um, so I think that uh, that will all come out in the work that this committee does in some fashion. Yeah, I just think maybe we don't, maybe us and the school don't emphasize it enough, you know, um, for the taxpayers, you know, I think taxpayers are interested in, you know, what we've done that saves money sometimes. Um, and there are things, it, it does happen. So even oh, when a budget, even when the overall budget goes up, you know, we've gotten more efficient in an X, Y, Z area or something like that. Um, you know, Betsy, that's a, that's a way to frame it. it is, you know, and maybe it's a worth a, a, a fourth target, but identify areas where you've worked to innovate or become more efficient. So they can tell us what they've done. Right. I'd be okay with that. I have totally messed up my view somehow and I can't get back. It's crazy. So I have no idea if I look crazy, but um, you look you fine. Guys, I'll stop you sharing. You guys were huge on my screen. <laughs> like, it's like, 
Oh, if I, if I'm, if I, if I look at that on other people's screens, that's just sad. <laughs> yeah. So John, you brought up your, your wonder, um, graphs and everything. It's so interesting that you rolled up um, by that account number because I did that last year on the school side. I rolled everything up to the account number. And I, I think that is a very interesting way to look at it. What is overall salaries? What is overall supplies? What is overall? I mean, every company you ever work with kind of kind of looks at that. And then, of course, you got to get back to department level. But um, I, I, I wish we, you know, had had done that more. I know, uh, the budget committee last year on the BOE side kind of asked for some of that. And it was just a matter of rolling it up. I had to extract it and then put it in a spreadsheet, probably like you did, and and roll it up. And I'm not saying we'd look at that going forward, but it it was really hugely helpful from looking at the budget side because you kind of you kind of looking at it and going, huh, you know. Um, and there was explanations for everything, so I'm not, you know, it wasn't critical, but it was it was really interesting to look at that view. So it, it, just to kind of finish my point there is like, I, I think when you're looking at things by cost center and by all of these divisions, mm -hmm. it can be a little bit much um, if you're trying to just communicate a high level snapshot for the town. So this is a little more granular breakdown and the budget book does this as well. Um, it, it looks at general government, public service. So like general government, for example, that's um, executive human resources, finance, uh, information and planning. Uh, you can kind of roll things up that way between public service, which would include fire and uh, actually no, public service would be community services, the library and SEDCO. Public safety would be the fire and police. Uh, so there's like four buckets for the town side and then you still just, uh, I, I think for what we're reporting out, probably just look at education as education. Uh, but I, I guess that's something to give some thought to is what grain when we're when we're trying to convey information to the council and to the public, what level do we want to do it at? Especially if there's going to be a regular cadence to it. Right. And I like like I said, I like that that page I sent out of the budget book, you know, um, you know, where you really get a good comparison, 2018, 2019, budgeted, where we stand, you know, at this point in time. Um, so I you know. I think we're honing in on it. <laughs> um, that I, I, you know, and I don't know what what point the roll up helps. I mean, I think the roll up by cost center, you know, may help at budgeting time. I'm not sure that you'd report on that throughout the year, but um, yeah, these that was really interesting because I I did the exact same thing. I'm looking at at, at the sheet. So not as you, pretty with all the colors. So John. I didn't do that. What's that? <laughs> I didn't do it yeah. as pretty with all the colors. <laughs> um, it, so what you would add is like an actual column to that, something along those lines. The what? You would add an actuals column. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're and taking. this is just spending, but I'm okay with that. Great. Uh, is that something that, I mean, either the cost centers by wage and benefits, supplies, et cetera, or, or the... The, a different one. We can incorporate that and put that in the budget for those who want that um, high overview, and then still provide the detail by line item if we need to. Yeah, that for the budget that would be awesome. I think that would be interesting in the budget book, and then possibly for the the quarterly reporting um, that that you provide to us, including that view. What you know, how are things tracking? Um, looking at it by cost center as opposed to just by entity. So that I don't have to recreate the wheel. Is that something you can send? Yes. And, <laughs> and, um, so right now I map things using the, the verbiage that was in the budget book, right? You might have a mapping already that breaks things out by, you know, that way. I'd be interested in, in what you have, but I can show you. And then if there's categories, like I came up with, I just came up with them, right? There might be some standards out there that we would want to kind of latch on to. So if we're doing any benchmarking or something like that, that would be easier but yes I'll uh, I will absolutely share and I anticipate like I'm not looking for this for you to do any work on this right now I think this is a conversation I want us to continue as we move through right, yeah. the year um, so that we can kind of hone in on what our needs are and um, and hopefully put something in place that will make sense yeah I agree it's longer than a five minute yeah. conversation yeah. yeah okay so 
procedurally, I, we've had a workshop. I'm going to write up these these goals, right? Do we need to have a meeting uh, so that people can actually digest them and have an action item to approve these as the uh, the budget targets? And then my my question, if the answer is yes, is does that have any impact on um, timing for for the budget process? I and mean, if we wait till February what 24th, I think is our next meeting. It's next week, I think, and it's. Paul, Paul said it looks like it's going to be a light um, agenda, so we might be able to cover it next week if we need to. I, I was thinking the f next time we meet as a finance committee. Oh. I, I think, John, I do think a written formal and a vote, this was a workshop. Yeah. But I think for the record, you know, um, emphasizing you know the three percent that we're targeting even though those are in the goals it's coming out of the finance committee too uh, emphasizing restorative um and uh you know which which might means we need an off cycle just one item meeting you know keep it keep it really short to kind of collapse you know get that get that exactly worded properly vote on it and then maybe we could do it before next week I, I, well i guess is there a time crunch liam for for this? Yeah, um, department budgets are due to the to the manager by the 26th. Um, so would, would the committee be receptive to holding a, a brief meeting before? I think you have an executive session scheduled for six o'clock next Wednesday, maybe a 5.30 brief yeah. finance committee meeting, something like that? I was thinking exactly the same thing. Okay. Right, and it doesn't mean we can't, I think we're all in agree with that. I don't, it doesn't mean we can't get them out so that the guidance is out there. I'm perfectly fine with that too. Yeah, well, I mean, you know what? We should have time to think about it and reflect, and 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 then you know, formalize it. So I'll 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 write this up and try to get it out, okay. you know, back out to you guys today, and um, yeah, that makes we'll, sense. We'll, we'll we'll plan a meeting for for next Wednesday. John, would you mind copying me on that draft? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, just so we can put it out and say it's it's draft format to be approved. You, you didn't see it. Ruth asked to. John. What's that? If you didn't see her, Ruth asked as well to send it to her. Oh, okay. Yep. I, I'll include everybody. Yeah, Sarah, you'll get a copy as well. Okay, good. We, um, Great. well, it took the two hours, but I, I feel like we got somewhere. And we'll see how it goes this year, right? It's not, um, it, there's no silver bullet, I guess, for, for what's going to make the process go perfectly. And, uh, but I think we're ready. I, I, we're going to do our best to be fair and equitable to uh, uh, to everybody. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to work with you guys on it. So, you want to take a few minutes before rules and policy? Same here. Yeah, same for Everyone has eight minutes. Yeah. We adjourn at uh, six p.m. Yeah. Is there a, is there a specific link for that, Liam? Or yeah, I'll, I can log in and resend it to you. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank guys, you guys. Thanks so much Thank for you. including me. Thank you. Great discussion.